Thanks for this invitation. It's really great to be here. New York City is one of my favorite places to visit. I appreciate the weather being so much nicer here than Colorado today. <laughs> we It feels like we've been living in Oregon for the last two weeks, so this is great. <laughs> Although it's raining here now, right? This afternoon, I brought it with me. I want to set the context about why do we need to and how do we need to improve indoor air quality? And then touch a little bit on how germicidal UV plays an important role. So the summary of my talk will hit three main topics. First, I'd like to talk about the health effects of air pollution. This is the why. This is why we all care about air pollution. Second, I'd like to talk about what impacts the air quality in building. And this is really important for the how. And third, I'd like to talk about air cleaning. It's required and how do we improve it? And this is also about the how. So let's start about health effects. When we breathe enough air daily to fill a standard swimming pool and that air is loaded with contaminants, it's obvious it will affect our health. There are both short-term and long-term effects of air pollution and the EPA, US EPA, sets air quality standards protect public health, including the most vulnerable from these effects. For PM 2.5, we have two standards. We have a short-term 24-hour standard that's 35 micrograms per cubic meter and an annual standard of 12 micrograms per cubic meter. So when you have an air quality monitor in your house and it hits higher than 35, you're gonna be worried and it often does. The WHO updated their guidelines in 2021 and drastically reduced the target concentration, for example, PM 2.5 and ozone. And so now the WHO recommends PM 2.5 to be five micrograms per cubic meter, which is much more realistic with the health effects. And ozone is lower both from WHO and Health Canada. And last but not least, of course, is airborne infectious diseases. As we know, this can drastically uproot our whole society, and we really need to pay attention to this as an air quality health problem. The London smog was the start of society finally realizing that not addressing air pollution would result in a public health crisis. An inversion lasting more than a week, emissions from coal, industry cars, trucks, added toxic pollutants to the mix, and that week, 4,000 people estimated to be dead. And the real full health, health toll was never really understood, but it could be upwards of 12,000 killed and more than 150,000 hospitalized. One of the most important air pollution studies was published in 1993, just as I was uh, studying air pollution control engineering at UC Berkeley. And it's called the Six City Study. They investigate the relationship between different air pollutants like gaseous oxidant pollutants, ozone, sulfur dioxide, and the particulate ones like sulfate PM and PM 2.5 and their relation to mortality. And these data were so surprising. They found that people living in the most polluted city, Steubenville, Ohio, in the US, were 26% more likely to die than those in the least polluted city, Portage, Wisconsin. This suggested this association between fine particulate pollution and higher death rates in urban areas. Uh, since then, many, many studies have supported these results. And current research shows that there's really no safe level of PM 2.5, even down to one microgram per cubic meter of PM 2.5. Ozone is a really strong oxidant being able to induce oxidative damage to cells and the lining of fluids of the airways and immune inflammatory responses within and beyond the lung. This graphic is from a 2009 study showing the exposure response curve for the relationship between exposure to ozone and the risk of death from respiratory diseases. The red line indicates the excess risk due to exposure at the EPA standard, currently set at 70 parts per billion. Note that this standard is violated much more often in the US than PM 2.5 standard. And Denver, Colorado is significantly out of compliance almost daily. At or above regulatory standards, day-to-day -day variations ozone have also been positively associated with acute asthma incidents 
and the Global Burden of Disease Study has attributed ambient ozone pollution to 234,000 deaths worldwide in 2016 and 3.8 million disability adjusted life lost that year. This diagram was recently published by our colleague Don Milton and co colleagues for the COVID pandemic to explain how airborne infections happen. When a person is infected with a virus or bacteria or mycobacteria and releases these respiratory particles by talking, singing, or even whispering, these particles can move through space on air currents depending on their size. And we've known for many decades that this is the way tuberculosis is transmitted, measles, chickenpox, and now COVID. All right, on to number two. Air quality standards and guidelines are based on health effects. So applying these works in every setting. We don't have to be outdoors to apply the EPA standard. We can be outdoors, but we can also be indoors because it's all about health effects. It's not about where you are. Inside, indoor emissions add to the pollutant version, pollutant burden, then we have outdoor air pollution, then we have chemistry, and we have deposition, we have ventilation and weather. We have all of this as well outside, but inside we have this very small volume that makes the effects much more significant. I really like this illustration, so I'd like to walk you through it. It was from a recent paper from some of my colleagues, uh, and it shows the pollutant transformations that occur between outdoor and indoor air from a recent paper. Let's start with the pie charts. They indicate fine mode particulate composition. And the large pie chart shows us that yellow is ammonia, orange is sulfur compounds, blue is NOx compounds, and green is organic. Note outdoor versus indoor differences in particle size distributions noted by the size of the circles, particle composition, ozone, and sources. So these solid black circles represent ultrafine and fine, ultrafine and coarse modes. So we've got the little black ones, ultrafine, big black ones, coarse. That's PM10 and above. These are all of outdoor origins. Buildings attenuate their outdoor to indoor transport. So more outside coming inside, but still coming inside. The solid light gray circles represent particles of indoor origin. And some of them go outside. We detect lots of household products in our outdoor air samples. Now we see multiple indoor sources. We have organic compounds resulting in indoor concentrations much larger than those outdoors. And indoor organics partition among the air, airborne particles, room, home, and surfaces. So we see this very complex um, chemistry, deposition, physics going on in a building. And this is why we need to understand what to do about reducing the health effects of all of this. Just a reminder, outdoor air pollution is mostly combustion generated. As we begin to decrease, this just occurred to me with all of these huge wildfires happening that I was been so excited with climate change, getting rid of cars and combustion from fossil fuel in our cars and our transport system. And then realizing that climate change was not only driving us to reduce the dependence on fossil fuel, but it was driving the increase of wildfires. So now we have like, we've changed the problem, right? We still have these combustion related pollution that's causing our health effects. But in Denver, we also add pet manufacturing, pet food manufacturing, meat rendering plants, creosote factories, wastewater treatment plants, oil and gas industry. So all of this in North Denver is contributing to our outdoor air pollution. And so you can think about what's contributing to your in outdoor air pollution in your region. Indoors, I wanna highlight the toxic chemicals that we're all exposed to every day. If you're not aware of the sixclasses.org uh, resource, I highly recommend that you check it out. It classifies all of the toxic chemicals in our environment into six classes. And what we really need to be doing is reducing the use of these six classes. The first one is highly fluorinated chemicals. These are from water, stain repellent carpet, water repellent clothes, water repellent shoes. Second is antimicrobials from body care and household care products. 
Third is flame retardants. They're in your electronics. They're in your furniture. They may be in the seats you're sitting on right now. Uh, plasticizers found in detergents, fragrances, vinyl flooring, VOCs from solvents and paints and glues in your furniture and certain metals toxic to humans like lead and mercury all are in your env indoor environments. These emissions are from building materials, building occupants and what we do inside. This graphic shows the chemistry that can happen indoors when there's ozone present, brought indoors from outside by ventilation or infiltration. So even though indoor level, levels of ozone are typically 30% of outdoor levels, the ozone reacts with what's inside. So at the top graph A, we have primary emissions such as the smell that occurs when you peel an orange. Radicals are then formed in the, in the indoor environment as in graph C and subsequent selected oxidation products and ultrafine particles are formed, as you see in slides D, E, and F. Ventilation is a crucial mediator for indoor air quality, and yet we have historically used ventilation mainly for thermal comfort and disregard for energy consumption with disregard also for indoor air quality. Mechanical ventilation brings some air inside, it conditions it to make you comfortable, and then it distributes it throughout the building. We can do better. Homes are ventilated not through mechanical ventilation, but through air leakage called infiltration, and this is incredibly energy inefficient. We use also exhaust fans in bathrooms or in the kitchen over the stove, making sure that your exhaust fan actually goes outside and not just blowing it back into your face, which most of them seem to do in the US these days, um, or by natural ventilation, which is opening a window. Finally, we have a recommended ventilation rate from the Lancet Commission earlier this year, of which I was a member. And it's based on all the available science, and we recommend that the best non-infectious delivery rates for ventilation are greater than six air changes per hour or 14 liters per second per person. This rate can be made up of a combination of outside air plus cleaned air. And the CDC also released their latest ventilation guidelines and our support, support these recommendations. So now we finally have a target for what we need to be doing as a minimum in buildings and greater than six is the way to go. I highlight here a study we conducted with ASHRAE support that investigated the levels of ultra fine and fine particulate matter coming into public buildings through infiltration and ventilation with the goal of improving understanding of filtration needs in buildings. Uh, we use an ultra high sensitivity aerosol spectrometer and an aerodyne mass spectrometer, which, which measured ultrafine and fine particulate matter plus the chemistry of those particles. We did our research in at the CU. This is CU. This is an office building in Denver. This is a school in Boulder, and this is a school in Denver. The buildings had standard filtration, typical air handlers, and they provided outdoor air rates of between one and nine air changes per hour. So what did we find? We found that the indoor particle levels were highly correlated with outdoor levels. We did find that in the larger particle sizes, oh, sorry about that. The larger particle sizes as, as highlighted by the red circle, they went up because of the occupancy in the buildings, resuspending the particles. However, they did not increase during the weekend, weeknights, when nobody was in the building. We also found that the HVAC, when it was on, brought in more indoor particles indoors, but yet when it was off, particles were still coming indoors through infiltration. On to air cleaning. Because air quality is degraded indoors by the processes just reviewed, filtration and air cleaning are essential to improve indoor air quality, especially now when it's critical to reduce the amount of energy we use in developing countries to condition our buildings. So right now we are estimating 30% of our energy, 30% of our carbon budget is going to cooling and heating these buildings. That's just outrageous and we need to figure out how to do that. Air cleaning is essential. 
Unfortunately, the science is limited at present that there and there is only significant evidence of health benefits for porous media particle filtration, such as in HEPA filters. The current ASHRAE position document on air cleaning states that a key position is that filtration and air cleaning technologies are not recommended for use if they produce significant amounts of contaminants that are known to or expected to be harmful for health. Germicidal UV is a tool that's crucial for many situations. I wanna highlight one of our biggest tools that we are not taking advantage of in our buildings, which is single pass air cleaning and HPAC systems. I'm gonna highlight here both particulate filtration, which is that if we improve our particulate filtration and we improve our maintenance, we're going to reduce fine PM indoors, we're gonna improve health, we're gonna reduce negative odor, negative health, and negative productivity impacts. And I'll show you some of the data to support these statements. We also really do need improved oxidative gas filtration. We're constantly bringing in ozone and NOx in urban areas into our indoor environments, impacting the health of our occupants. And if we reduce those gases indoors, we'll reduce not only, we'll improve not only the health, reduce the negative health effects, but we could also minimize the excess chemistry that's going on indoors because of these oxidative gases. So I, I wanna highlight this study out of Netherlands. It shows just how important improved filtration is. They installed a new mechanical ventilation system with fine F8 or MER14, which is HEPA filtration, in a high school located near a really busy road. And we know the closer you are to a busy roadway, the more your health is impacted. They measured PM10, PM2.5, and black carbon inside this classroom and outside of the classroom during three sampling periods. So these graphics show the diagonal pattern of outdoor and indoor pollutant concentrations. So this first panel is the baseline where we don't have any filtration and we just have the standard mechanical ventilation. Then the second is when we put in this new ventilation system, but we still don't improve the filtration. And the third is when we put in the new ventilation and we also improve the filtration. And we see an impact that reduces exposure to these pollutants by 30% in the schools, which would be significant for children in terms of improving their health. I also love this study by Wargaki and all, uh, DTU. And it shows just how important proper filter maintenance is for productivity. So this was just a standard filter put into a test chamber where we had occupants that were doing productivity type tasks, mainly talking. And if you increase your talk time, then that was a decrease in productivity. And if you decrease your talk time, then that was better for productivity. And what we see is that if we, if the talk, the, we see that the talk time decreases, productivity increase when the filter was new and the ventilation rate was high. So that's the best combination, like a new filter, good ventilation, right? However, when we replace the new filter with an old dirty filter, now we increase the talk time and decrease productivity. So the dirty filters Im impact productivity. We also see that reducing the ventilation rate with a used filter decreases talk time, which is very interesting. And finally, no effect was seen when the used filter was replaced with a new one at low ventilation rates. So paying attention to what you're doing with your filters and when can really impact Plus your ventilation rate can impact your productivity. And that is a number one cost in buildings is the people and what they're doing. Just highlighting air cleaners. One of my first papers for my PhD dissertation published in 1996 was testing of air cleaners for reducing airborne transmission of tuberculosis. This slide reminds us of the physics at work when airborne particles are drawn through porous media and they're physically removed from the airstream. It's very similar to what happens in our lungs. And I highlight the 99 percentile because that's a HEPA filtration removal efficiency of 0.3 microns. I wanna highlight one of my student projects. Uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic, I said to my class, okay, let's do projects. We're all remote. My student builds a Corsi Rosenthal do-it-yourself air cleaner and test it in her home. 
What she finds is that during cooking, there's an increase in formaldehyde, organic gases, and PM 2.5. However, when she runs that air cleaner in her small apartment, she reduces the PM 2.5 exposure by 92%. It was a small room, and that Corsi Rosenthal box was the right capacity for reducing exposure. In collaboration with Joe Allen's group at Harvard, we developed a tool to size air cleaners appropriately. I think this is a very critical point. Don't just go out and buy an air cleaner. You need to buy the air cleaner or multiple air cleaners that work for the size of the environment that you're putting them in. This tool was available for schools during the COVID pandemic. And we need to make sure that we also say to our patients, our colleagues, our friends, when you buy an air cleaner, make sure it's sized appropriately for your room. Otherwise you're spending $300 for nothing or building your DIY air cleaner for 80 bucks. <laughs> Okay, on to UV, UV disinfection before I conclude my talk today. I'll highlight mostly the upper room air disinfection application because that's where most of my research has been done, although we have done some ventilation applications as well. I got into this because in the early 2000s, we had a resurgent in drug-resistant tuberculosis, and we really needed something to control the pandemic of this um, very deadly disease around the world. An upper room UV from 254 nanometer wavelength mercury vapor lamps seemed like our best bet. I wanna highlight what I think of the, the appropriate applications for UV. There are rooms in which infectious aerosol may be generated, coughing patient rooms, um, where you're in uh, possibly isolation rooms, treatment rooms. I'd also like to, highlight that rooms where you need a higher air change, we wanna to get to greater than six, your rooms below six, required hospital ventilation rates are closer to 12, very expensive to do your ventilation retrofit, upper room UV is the perfect answer for those kinds of problems. Finally, they also are the perfect problem, perfect solution for crowded environments where unsuspected infection persons may be present. And I highlight homeless shelters, hospital waiting rooms, jails, and also even schools. Um, in the pandemic, when I was working with the city of Seattle, they came to me and said, I don't, we don't know what to do with these homeless shelters because there's no ventilation. It's just a warehouse that we've been provided to house, house the unhoused. So what do we do? I said, well, you really can't put in enough air cleaners into that ginormous space. Let's turn to upper room UV. And that was a really appropriate application for, for that technology. Of course, we love Dr. Wells and this wonderful example of application of upper room UV in schools in Philadelphia that reduced the incidence of measles in classrooms. And I really like the first sentence of its paper that reads the prevalence of respiratory infection during the season of indoor congregation suggests a natural relationship between ventilation and communicable disease. And how long did it take us to figure that out through the pandemic? Like, it's just crazy. <laughs> I'll briefly summarize our studies conducted with CDC support with the intent of using the results to promulgate guidelines for hospitals and healthcare facilities in the use of UV during the resurgence of TB these guidelines are perfectly applicable to any airborne infectious disease pandemic and should have been used in the pandemic recently. Uh, I don't see that they were applied very effectively at all. Our studies were done in an 87 cubic meter room in which we installed five UV lamp fixtures evenly dispersed in the upper part of the room, which is critical. And we delivered a total of 42 microwatts per centimeter squared. This is a picture of my PhD student suiting up for aerosolization of BCG, which is a class three pathogen at CU Boulder. <laughs> An example of our results is shown here. First of all, the system was more than 80% effective against mycobacteria. So we have here the effectiveness and we have very effective results for the inactivation of airborne bacteria. Unfortunately, when you start ventilating at wintertime conditions, meaning you put hot air in at the ceiling, you depress mixing and you get no effect of the UV. We show there's a linear relationship between increasing 
UV radiance and equivalent air exchange rates. At the top end, as you increase UV radiance more and more, you will see in a subsequent paper that we show that this curve does, over, does actually roll over and you're gonna be wasting your money putting in extra UV. You're not gonna get any bang for your buck. I like this quote from a paper that was using an ep epidemiological model to look at intervention strategies against infectious diseases. And they found that UV was the optimal strategy combined with isolation and vaccination interventions. Perhaps this is a lesson here for the current pandemic. And in our current study, which we just published, I'll talk to a little bit later, we found the same results. So here are the CDC NIOSH guidelines from 2008. You need a uniform UVC radiation. You need 30 to 50 microwatts per centimeter cubed. You need 1.87 watts per meter squared of lamps per floor area or six watts per cubic meter of lamps for upper zone volume. You need your humidity to be less than 60%, which can be difficult. You need your room to air to be mixed. I'm gonna highlight my colleague Josephine Lau's study in uh, elementary school classrooms in Nebraska. I think this paper is really indicative of how we can apply UV in other types of settings. So this is an example of her classroom where she did a blinded intervention switching between UV and non-UV and sampled the bioaerosol three times a day. And these results show that during the October, November, and December months when the bacteria levels were high, the UV rooms were significantly lower in concentration, that's this dark green, compared to the non-UV rooms. In January, the bacterial loads were too low to determine any effect. And finally, I wanna highlight that we have seen that upper room UV is in fact safe in this great study by the Nardell crew in the tuberculosis UV shelter study, we found that absolutely nobody was injured through the application of UV in this um, important uh, setting over the course of a year. My last topic today before I, before I conclude, uh, and then we can have time for questions, is that we, we wanted to understand what to do with all the building types we have Okay, we have schools, we have stores, we have hotels, we have commercial office spaces, not to mention healthcare facilities. Every building is different. Every HVAC system is different. What you do inside is different. Well, what are you gonna do with all these building types, all these uses, all these sources in order to, re in order to improve air quality, especially with regards to infectious disease control? So we decided instead of to go out and spend millions of dollars studying all these types of buildings, we would model them using very, very good, uh, recent and, and useful models. And so what we did was ask these questions, what are the aerosol transmission risks in these types of buildings and how do we use engineering control strategies to reduce the risk? So we use NIST and DOE models called CONTAM and Energy Plus. And these models have been developed over decades to characterize building air quality and assess energy efficiency. And we adapted these models for infectious disease transmission. And we modeled the release of an infectious quanta within a building that was appropriate at this time for the COVID transmission. And we accounted for all of these important uh, dynamics in the indoor environment, including deposition, infiltration, ventilation, filtration, germicidal UV. And then we predicted what would be the best approach to reduce risk. So here's an example of one of our results. So this is for the large 10 story office building. There were 134 people that were susceptible in the occupied zone and one infectious person. Now, in order to reduce the risk of an outbreak, we had to keep the risk below 0.75%. All right, that's what this, this is for a public health outbreak of 0.75%. Uh, and what we see is that the exposure risk for every mitigation strategy works if there's universal masking. All right, you can do whatever you want. You don't even have to do anything. You just have to have everyone to be masked, all right? 
here's the dark blue masking strategies. Um, and we know that, that in some countries that's very difficult to make happen <laughs> and request uh, our citizens to participate. And so what do we do next? Well, all of the ventilation and filtr filtration strategies really weren't enough, all right? So we have, oh, let's see, let's increase our filtration to MERV 11, MERV 13. Not enough. Uh, okay, well, let's put in some portable air cleaners. Okay, yeah, not enough. What worked? UV in room, 100% outside air, and this giant, and this very, very big hospital grade portable air cleaner that provided 10 air changes per hour. Okay, now this germicidal UV upper room was a four air change per hour supplement to the ventilation of outside air at around three. So in conclusion, I just wanna summarize. I told you what I was gonna tell you, then I told you, and now I'm gonna tell you what I told you in case you missed it all. <laughs> Air pollution causes illness, causes excess death, early death, and ozone and PM 2.5 in particular, and airborne infectious disease uh, agents. Indoor air pollution is from outdoor air, indoor emissions, mediated by ventilation, air cleaning, chemistry, deposition, occupants, complicated. Filtration clearly reduces PM 2.5 indoors and clearly improves public health. Ozone removal is needed. Science is not conclusive on the best method to do this, but we do think reducing that will improve public health, reduce odors and improve productivity. 254 nanometer germicidal UV has decades of evidence on efficacy, implementation methods, and applications. We need to be using it. GUV is the most effective in reducing infectious disease transmission in commercial buildings. And onward to the topic of this entire next three days, which is that new methods such as 222 nanometer GUV possibly LEDs, need more research to understand implementation methods and applications so that we can grow our impact of the air cleaning in our buildings and reduce health effects of both outdoor, indoor air pollution and infectious diseases. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Shelley, for a great sort of introduction to that bigger picture of everything we need to think about in indoor air. And of course, the studies that have been done in the past on air cleaners and 254 nanometer UV, which really need to inspire what we need to do for 222. So we have a few minutes for, for questions. Anyone? I can see Ed with his hand up over there. I think there's a, a mic on its way to you. Thanks, Shelley, for that introduction. Um, I have two two issues. Uh, one, I think that you know, really, we have to get very specific in terms of what the pollutant is, and how it and how transmission occurs in the case of infectious particles. Uh, I've had this ongoing argument with Joe Allen, my colleague at Harvard, because I say, Joe, show me the evidence of COVID. None of us would be sitting here today, I don't think, if it were not for the COVID pandemic, even though we should be for many other reasons. But nonetheless, I said, show me the evidence of transmission from one room to another room without direct contact with, with uh, COVID-19. And as far as I know, there isn't any. Now, it's very hard to disprove, you know, something doesn't happen. It happens with measles. It happens with TB that infectious particles are carried through the ventilation system, infecting somebody in another part of the building. It has not been reported, to my knowledge, for uh, COVID-19. I don't know whether it's dilution or fragility of the virus. You can find the virus in the ducts on the surfaces, but you don't. Epidemiologically, there has not. So to me, putting MERV-13 filters in schools as a first approach to stopping COVID transmission what are you stopping if, there, if, if you're not getting recirculation through the ventilation system epidemiologically? And, you know, we have just recently shown in South Africa that you can do it, 
uh, from transmission from humans to hamsters uh, of COVID-19. But it's striking how that we, after three years, we haven't heard these reports. Uh, can I comment on that first? I, I think that's an important distinction, and I and I do want to comment that there have been a few papers, and I will be publishing one in the next year, showing that there is transmission between multiple floors of residential facilities that do not that do not have any you know residential like apartment buildings multifamily housing, the ventilation systems, how we operate them are much different. So for example, the study that I'm concluding showed that, um, and the, this is how many buildings have been designed. For example, um, in Spain, where I spent my sabbatical, where they move air between floors of the multifamily housing through convection. And the air is always pulled out of the bathroom and put into a shaft and that shaft goes up the building and then the air goes, from each apartment goes into the shaft and then the air, saw the, the air goes up the building. So this is also how another uh, report of transmission happened in Hong Kong as well. And we see transmission happening in that kind of multifamily, multi-floor, multi-room housing situation. Very easy to control, mind you. You just need to put a flap on the on the and, and make sure you have a fan. It's it's very easy, but but it hasn't been done. So there is transmission that way. So I'm thinking, well, there's something different about mechanical systems yes. that impact the way transmission happens between floors. Now our model did predict it would happen, very very um, at very small numbers, probably not enough to cause infection. So I, again, I agree with you, and and the 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 toilet shaft is certainly an exception between floors, but highly concentrated source and minimal dilution, I would say. But at any rate, uh, I think it's important to know where, so it's in the room, really, we have to focus, I think, at least for this particular problem. For all the other things you mentioned, filters may be just the right thing. And then finally, uh, in the mixing business, uh, with you, you mentioned that if you don't have mixing, you'll get no effect. I don't think Wells had mixing in those schools. No. You have a crowded classroom, Kids are generating heat. You get pretty good mixing under winter conditions, which is when kids go to school mostly. So I didn't want to let that go, that you absolutely yeah. have to have vigorous mixing to have UV effective. You don't. No, well, most indoor spaces are well mixed as a first approximation. It's not, it's not a problem for you to assume that your space will be well mixed with all this number of people in here. The problem comes when you have forced mechanical ventilation that then can disturb the natural mixing that happens in an indoor space. So those classrooms, for sure, they didn't have mechanical ventilation. They probably had radiators, which then helped with the mixing. So yeah, thank you for pointing that out. Uh, I think that it's important that we not be too much focused on the last war, COVID, because with the um, COVID has also come a resurgence of anti-vaccine ideologies and we have seen multiple measles outbreaks in the United States in the last couple of years, including here in New York City. And so I think we need to be thinking about these highly contagious infections um, that can sp clearly spread through ventilation systems and be prepared. Um, this isn't going away. Um, we even have now a candidate uh, running as a Democrat who is primarily an anti-vaccine candidate. So um, this isn't going away. It's going to get worse. And I think we need to be prepared to offer some solutions to that. Yeah, multi-pronged solution is best, especially for energy efficient, healthy buildings. Uh, I still think we need adequate filtration and UV where it's, where it's needed. So thank you for that, Dawn. Have any other questions from the audience? Yeah, I was wondering if you could uh, comment on the utility of PM 1.0 measurements now, since they're mass per unit volume measurements, not particulate number density. And it course, sort of corresponds with your dip in the filtration efficiency just below one micron. So do you see that as a, as a metric we should be using in the future? 
I definitely think we should be paying attention to ultrafine particles. We're seeing in the research um, literature that the health effects are substantial. Uh, they go th everywhere in your body. You find them in your brain, your liver, your everywhere. And so the ultrafines, what they are, uh, and I think they're, they can be and will be shown to be much more toxic. And we really need to be focusing on measuring those. Thankfully, Filtration works well for ultrafine particles. Uh, you saw in the filtration curve that it goes up because of Brownian motion and diffusion. So we are able to remove ultrafine particles through filtration. Um, and that's below 0.1 microns. The minimum happens at 0.3. Um, and again, for HEPA filtration, that's enough. Hey, we've got time for one more. Thank you so much for a terrific talk. Um, you've spoken about ozone, generate about the dangers of ozone, and of course, here we are at the UVC light conference talking about potentially creating, putting in more ozone on indoor environments. And also, you mentioned that the science behind it is not crystal clear. So, would you mind going over a bit of some options as far as what are potential mitigation strategies if we'll be generating ozone? What are some options, and how realistic it is really for us to take that out? And mitigate those risks kind of head on. Thank you so much. Yeah, I'll take some brief comments. Um, we de we know the science is really clear on how ozone reacts with organic compounds and generates ultrafine particles. So that piece, that, that, that piece of the science from the air atmospheric scientists, we know very well. We know what happens outdoors. We know what happens indoors. We know, for example, in Atlanta, because I have huge forests and they have lots of ozone, they have lots of ultrafine particulate matter. And that's an outdoor air, pro outdoor air problem. We also know indoors that when ozone comes in and you release VOCs, you generate ultrafine particles. So that piece we know. What we don't really know very well is how to best remove ozone as you bring it in from the outdoors. Okay, activate a carbon, seems to work. It fills up pretty quickly, you gotta replace it. Maybe that's not the best. Permit potassium permanganate maybe, maybe a catalyst. I don't know, I was looking through the literature looking for those papers that told me how to do it and I couldn't find them. There's lots of options, not clear which one's the best. So we need to figure out which one is the best to remove ozone coming indoors. That would help us a lot to keep the ozone out of the building and that would reduce the problem of possibly generating this ultrafine particulate matter from these chemi chemical reactions. Um, I think maybe the NOx problem could contribute. We still need to maybe understand that. I know that's happened um, in buildings. So I think that how do we air clean for ozone? It's also very hard to monitor for ozone. You know, doing a good job of monitoring ozone costs a lot of money. These low cost sensors for ozone aren't super great. Um, so, so still, I think there's a lot of work to be done on how do we air clean. If we're going to be generating ozone indoors, then we really need to have adequate ventilation and we need to have adequate air cleaning for our buildings. So thank you. I really, I know this is such a diverse audience. We have, um, we have physicians and engineers and, and technical people and health people. And so I'm just really grateful that you stuck with me because I was thinking, what, what do I tell these great individuals about indoor air quality. So I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you.